This is a video in Clinical Medicine from the New England Journal of Medicine. Examination of the neck veins is routinely performed to evaluate right atrial pressure and to estimate intravascular volume in patients with dyspnea, edema, or hypovolemia. In patients with dyspnea or edema, it is essential to estimate the venous pressure and to perform the abdominal jugular reflux test at the bedside, as Bubba describes later in this video. If the venous pressure is elevated or the abdominal jugular reflux test result is abnormal, it is very likely that the patient has heart disease, for example, left or right ventricular failure. If the venous pressure and the abdominal jugular reflux test results are normal, the dyspnea or edema probably is not caused by heart disease, but by some other condition, such as pulmonary, liver or kidney disease. The external and internal jugular veins receive blood from the brain, face and neck, and they drain into the brachiocephalic veins. The retromandibular vein and the posterior auricular vein join at the angle of the mandible to form the external jugular vein, which receives blood from the outer part of the cranium and the deep tissues of the face and neck. The external jugular vein runs inferiorly in the subcutaneous tissue of the anterolateral region of the neck, beneath the platysma muscle but superficial to the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Then, the vein pierces the deep cervical fascia posterior to the clavicular head of the sternocleidomastoid muscle and drains into the subclavian vein. The internal jugular vein is formed by the convergence of the inferior petrosal sinus and the sigmoid duro-venous sinus, which are in or just distal to the jugular foramen. In addition, the internal jugular vein descends alongside the internal carotid artery in the carotid sheath and continues posteriorly to the space between the two heads of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Then the vein merges with the subclavian vein to form the brachiocephalic vein, which drains blood from the brain, face and neck. When you are locating the neck veins, begin by evaluating the right side of the neck, because the right jugular veins have a more direct course to the heart than the left. Raise the head of the bed to an angle of 30 to 45 degrees. This is generally the best position for locating the neck veins. If you cannot locate the neck veins with a patient in this position, raise or lower the head of the bed by 15 to 30 degrees and look for the veins again. Raising the head of the bed results in a decrease in venous pulsations, while lowering the head of the bed results in an increase of the venous pulsations. However, in patients with conditions such as orthopnea, Lowering the head of the bed might not be practical because it can worsen the patient's symptoms. Ask the patient to turn his or her head slightly to the left and relax the neck so that the sternocleidomastoid muscle is not excessively tense and does not obscure the venous pulsations. Dim the light in the room and shine a flashlight toward the patient's right ear. You should see the external jugular vein lying across the sternocleidomastoid muscle directed toward the mandible. Two downward flicking movements should be visible at the superior portion of the vessel. These two descending movements correspond to the X' prime descent and the Y' descent on a tracing. In this tracing, you can see a jugular venous waveform that corresponds to different portions of the cardiac cycle. The A wave corresponds to right atrial contraction. Its peak denotes the end of atrial systole. The X' descent denotes right atrial relaxation. The C wave denotes right ventricular contraction and closure of the tricuspid valve. The X prime descent, which begins during ventricular systole, reflects the downward movement of the right atrial floor and contraction of the right ventricle. The V wave corresponds to right atrial filling and the Y descent, which begins during diastole, reflects the filling of the right ventricle after the opening of the tricuspid valve. If it is difficult to identify the external jugular vein, you can try several other methods to aid in identification. Press on the base of the patient's neck above the clavicle with your index finger. Superior to your finger, the vein should become engorged and visible. 
Ask the patient to perform the Valsalva maneuver. The maneuver should result in engorgement of the external jugular vein superiorly toward the mandible. However, the Valsalva maneuver might not be practical in some patients with dyspnea, as it may lead to clinical deterioration. Press on the patient's abdomen, either the right upper quadrant or the area between the epigastrium and the umbilicus. Make sure to apply only moderate pressure and use extreme caution or avoid this technique if the patient has abdominal pain or a history of abdominal aortic aneurysm. The external jugular vein should become engorged and then should empty instantly after you have stopped applying pressure to the abdomen. The internal jugular vein lies deep within the neck between the two heads of the sternocleidomastoid muscle and might not be visible. However, on the patient's neck, you may be able to see two downward flicking movements at the top of the vessel which correspond to the X prime and Y descents on a tracing. If you are unable to see the two downward flicking movements, raise or lower the head of the bed by 15 to 30 degrees and look for them again. The internal jugular vein can also be detected by compressing the abdomen as described earlier. To estimate the venous pressure, you can use either the external or internal jugular vein in which the two descending movements are generally visible because the pressure in both veins is similar. In hypovolemic patients, the methods mentioned previously may not identify the jugular veins. In this case, Placing the patient in the Trendelenburg position may permit identification of the jugular veins. The characteristic movements of the neck veins and the carotid artery are distinct. During ventricular systole, the jugular veins have two inward movements and the carotid artery has one outward movement. The jugular venous pulsations are not palpable whereas the carotid arterial pulsations can be easily palpated. During inspiration, jugular venous pulsations diminish but become more prominent in the lower part of the neck, whereas carotid arterial pulsations do not change. Similarly, when the patient is sitting up, jugular venous pulsations decrease in the neck, whereas carotid arterial pulsations do not change. When the abdominal pressure is increased, jugular venous pulsations become more prominent and move higher in the neck, whereas carotid arterial pulsations do not change. After you have located one of the jugular veins and make sure that the patient is not performing a Valsalva maneuver, which can produce a falsely elevated jugular venous pressure, then you can measure the jugular venous pressure. Observe the patient looking for the characteristic two descending movements of the external or internal jugular vein. Use the sternal angle, also called the angle of Louis, as the reference point for measuring the venous pressure when the head of the bed is at 30 to 45 degrees. Note that the sternal angle is not an accurate reference point when the patient is in a completely supine or completely upright position. This is because the neck veins are fully engorged when the patient is in the supine position and fully collapsed when the patient is sitting or standing upright. Using a small metric ruler, measure the distance from the highest point of venous pulsation to the sternal angle. A distance of less than 3 cm is normal. You can add 5 to this distance to estimate the jugular venous pressure in centimeters of water. Thus, when the jugular venous pressure is more than 3 cm above the sternal angle, which is the distance that corresponds to 8 cm of water, the pressure is considered to be elevated. The presence of elevated jugular venous pressure is 57% sensitive and 93% specific for the detection of elevated right atrial pressure. A totally flat jugular venous pressure corresponds to less than 5 cm of water and generally indicates hypovolemia. The abdominal jugular reflux test measures the jugular venous pressure through the distension of the internal or external jugular vein while the abdomen is being compressed. It can be used to detect elevated right atrial pressure. Therefore, it is an important bedside examination to detect the cause of dyspnea or edema.
After you have measured the jugular venous pressure, press on the patient's abdomen, either the right upper quadrant or the area between the epigastrium and the umbilicus. It is prudent to apply the pressure gradually and gently to avoid eliciting hepatic pain in patients with heart failure. Exert moderate and sustained pressure for approximately 10 seconds. Remember to use extreme caution or avoid this technique if the patient has abdominal pain or a history of abdominal aortic aneurysm. Then note the increase in the filling of the jugular vein. Measure the pressure in centimeters of water. Compare this measurement with the previously obtained measurement of the jugular venous pressure. Note for how many seconds the increase in the jugular venous pressure is sustained. The abdominal jugular reflux test results is abnormal when the increase in the jugular venous pressure is more than 4 cm of water and is sustained for the entire 10 seconds of abdominal compression. An abnormal abdominal jugular reflux test result indicates that the right atrial pressure is elevated. Such a finding in the patient with dyspnea indicates heart failure on the right side. A normal abdominal jugular reflux test result decreases the probability that the patient has elevated filling pressure on the right side of the heart. When the abdominal jugular reflux test and jugular venous pressure are combined, they are 80% sensitive and 81% specific for the detection of elevated right atrial pressure. Paradoxical elevation of the jugular venous pressure during inspiration is called Kuzmol's sign. In a healthy person, the venous pressure decreases during inspiration because pressure on the right side of the heart falls as intrathoracic pressure decreases. The differential diagnosis for Kuzmol's sign includes constrictive pericarditis, severe heart failure, pulmonary embolism, and right ventricular infarction. Examination of the neck veins can be easily performed in less than a minute and poses little risk to the patient. Direct examination of the neck veins, estimation of venous pressure, and performance of the abdominal jugular reflux test are essential for evaluating right atrial pressure and estimating intravascular volume in patients with dyspnea, edema, or hypovolemia.